Great. Um, all right, well, I guess we'll get started. Um, so hello, everyone. Thank you all for coming to uh, the Bidwell House Museum's first talk in our 2023 winter lecture series. Uh, I'm Heather Kowalski, the executive director of the museum. And before we begin, I just want to note a couple of things. First, please keep yourself muted so we don't get any background noise, uh, but you're welcome to leave your camera on during the presentation. The controls for both of those things should be at the bottom lower left of your Zoom screen. Uh, if you have any questions for Misty during the presentation, please type them into the chat feature at any point during the talk, and we will take some time at the end to answer any of your questions as we can. Uh, the next talk in this series will be with Dennis Picard on February 15th. And for those of you interested in more outdoor activities, we also have a guided hike on the grounds coming up on January 28th. And you can register for both of those programs on the events page of our website. And now to tonight's speaker, Misty Cook. Uh, Misty has studied herbal medicines in depth, including plant identification, gathering and drying methods throughout the year, and preservation techniques. She's the author of Medicine Generations, Natural Native American Medicines Traditional to the Stockbridge Muncie Band of the Mohican Tribe. Misty is also a cultural consultant with a master's degree in management and provides diversity training on many topics, including Native American students in education, Native American history, Native American games, and herbal medicines. And now I am happy to present uh, Misty Cook. Hi, thank you for inviting me to um, do this presentation. Um, it's starting to snow over here in Wisconsin right now again, so we just got through a whole bunch of rain and ice storms, so, um, so now we're onto the snow. <laughs> so we're in full-fledged winter. But I always like to start out the presentations um, by acknowledging our ancestors and thanking them for, you know, all they did to help preserve the medicines and pass down all the information, and um, we always start with um, Granny Gardner. The, um, the person who's on front on the front of the book. And um, she was my great, 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 great grandma. And um, she was um, from the Oneida tribe and she lived out in New York and when she was little. And at age nine, her mom wanted her to come to Wisconsin because she thought it would be a better life for her in Wisconsin at the time. And um, Granny Gardner always called New York, York State. And I thought, Wow, I always think that's so cool. And then um, when um, our, the people in our family, my aunts and uncles and people like that, when they always talk about the story, they always think it's really neat that she called it York State. So, um, so uh, she was a midwife and a medicine woman. She delivered um, many, many babies in the area for, the, uh, for our community and for the surrounding community. And, um, and she also did a lot of medicine. She learned medicines at, at a young age and, um, and then passed them down to my grandma, Grandma Mary, and um, Grandma Mary Burr, her name was. And um, I grew up with, um, she did medicines on us and um, it was just like here and there, um, medicines like um, she put a salve on our throat or um, I remember her doing something warm with my ear and, um, and teas and things like that. Then I remember gathering with her and um, she would gather, um, one time we gathered the raspberry leaves and um, we just gathered them in her yard and then she put down a sheet upstairs in her upstairs and then we just laid out the leaves on the sheet and let them dry. And she always used that one for, um, for diabetes, for like high blood sugar. Like if the blood sugar levels are getting a little high, then you would make that into a tea and, um, and then drink that. And she always had that one in her fridge um, already made. And then she would just kind of drink off that one she had diabetes at the end and then um, she would just drink off of that one and um, and then use that one regularly. And her sister, Ella Besaw, also really liked the, uh, the number six. And that one is the, or also liked the raspberry leaves. I'm sorry, I was talking about raspberry leaves. And um, she also used it for diabetes as well. And she did it the same way where she would make a jar of it keep it in the fridge and then just um, drink off of it as she needed it. And um, my grandma was raised by Granny Gardner, the one on the front of the book. And um, Ella, she was, um, she had to help raise her other brothers and sisters. So she didn't get to get 
she didn't get to live with Granny Gardner, but she spent a lot of time with Granny Gardner and, um, and also learned a lot about the medicines. It was said that Ella knew about a hundred of the medicines and um, she was always called to do um, presentations like at the schools and um, all over the place. And then people would come to her house. We grew up as her next door neighbor, her and her son, Dave Bisa. And I remember people coming over all the time. She always had lots of visitors. She had the medicines drying in her front porch or in her porch and, um, and uh, they would uh, go out gathering things like that. My mom would help them gather medicines and drive Ella to go do all those things. And um, so then she passed it down to her son, Dave. Dave started learning medicines when he was about age nine. And, um, and then he just, just from being with his mom a lot, he, he learned a lot of the medicines and he knew a lot of the stories. He was a really good storyteller. And uh, so he would tell all these stories over and over and over again. And uh, so that's what, how um, like the Native American tradition of storytelling, um, uh, they call it oral tradition. That's how a lot of the stories are passed down because a lot of the people are like really, really good storytellers. And it's very entertaining to listen to people and to talk with them. And, um, and that's how the, the stories are passed down. And you hear them a lot of times to help you remember remember them. So, um, so then he, um, he knew a lot of the medicines. And uh, when I, um, uh, when I was, when I had my daughter, I was um, working and everything like that and um, going to stay working. But when I had her, I just wanted to take care of her. And I just felt like I need to take care of this baby. So luckily I was able to stay home, be a stay at home mom. And at that time, Dave was doing a lot of presentations in the area. And then um, he had rheumatoid arthritis. So he needs somebody to come around and help him, um, help him pass out the medicines and things like that at his presentations. So he'd always ask me and the baby to go along. So we would go with him and, and help. And, um, and I just could not believe how much he remembered. He just had like such a great memory. He, you know, all these medicines that he would talk about and all this information. And um, after, I would say after about like five presentations, I thought we have to write this down. Um, he just remembers so much. So, um, so that's where I started kind of like writing it down a little bit. I went to like his next presentation and I just wrote down everything he said word for word. And then um, started asking him questions about, you know, like how exactly these are taken, where these medicines grow, um, what the dosages are, things like that. And it was, and it was always just going over to his house and visiting and um, talking and having fun about other things. But then we'd also talk about the medicines and I'd ask questions. Sometimes I'd have like a notebook of questions that I would ask him, things like that. So it was real, you know, comfortable, real laid back way of learning about it. And, um, but slowly and slowly, we got all the information together. And then we took a summer and looked for all the medicines. And um, some days, if he wasn't having, if he wasn't feeling the greatest that day, he might say, we'll go um, drive down this road and it'll be like on the corner of this road and that road. So we'd go and there would be the medicine. So it was kind of, it was kind of really neat to learn because um, it was kind of like, always like a little adventure. Like we didn't really know exactly where we were going, but we would go and we would find it. And then when he would come with us, that was also really fun too. And in the book, there's lots of stories in there of when we go gather the medicines and things like that. So, um, so it was always really fun. And um, it always seems like, it seemed like an adventure and uh, gathering medicines like that to me too, still feels like that where, you know, it's really fun and it's really enjoyable. It's really relaxing to me when I go out and gather and things like that too. So, um, so it's just a really, you know, I really enjoy doing the medicines. So what we're talking about tonight are the Mohican uses of medicines in the winter. So I'm gonna to touch on four of the medicines. Uh, we, have, we use more than that, but with our time and um, uh, you don't wanna hear me ramble all night long, but um, we'll touch on four of the medicines. And then um, I just wanna start out a little bit talking about when we gather, um, one one very important thing that we always do is we always offer tobacco. So um, we take um, you can use tobacco that's homegrown. You can use um, tobacco that you buy. We some people use like the the dried pipe 
<laughs> can't talk, the dried pipe tobacco um, that just that you buy. And, uh, and then we take a small handful of that. And um, sometimes we grab it like with our left hand and then have it in our palm. And then um, the belief is that if it's in your left hand, your prayer will come from your heart. And then we put the tobacco down by the medicine on the ground, or you can even um, just kind of put it over if it's like a little bush or a little, um, you know, a taller plant or something, you can just kind of like sprinkle it on top of there. And um, when you put the tobacco down, um, it'll be sure to go back. And it's also a thank, um, to be thankful for the plant. You're giving in order to receive something. Dave always said um, he would just sprinkle it on the plant. And then he said, if you sprinkle it on the plant and you give it, um, give your tobacco, it'll be sure to grow back. So um, in the Native American way, we believe that you need to give something in order to take something that, um, you know, that give and take relationship. And, um, and so, uh, so we always give that. It's also like acknowledging it, you know, thanking the plant, um, being thankful for the plant. Uh, it's kind of a really neat process when you go through the, when you're able to go through the whole process of gathering medicines. So you're putting your tobacco down, you're offering your thanks. Um, sometimes, you know, a lot of times I think about like um, the people that these medicines are going to go to, if I know if it's a specific person, or if I don't, like if I'm just gathering in the summer, I'm gathering is a lot um, because I gather for the um, entire tribe. If anybody needs it, I have it. Um, it will gather in the summer so we can have it in the winter for when people need it. So we're thinking ahead. We're thinking, you know, like six months, eight months ahead of time from when we need the medicines. And then um, after we put our tobacco down, then we can take the plant. So, um, so for the first one we'll talk about is the number six, the wild bergamot. And that plant grows in prairies, fields, um, and it's a plant, it probably grows about like this tall. Um, some patches we have, it grows really tall and really big. And um, that one, people know, know it as bee balm. And um, that one is a very, very popular one with our people. Uh, that one has uh, stood the test of time. Um, people have used that one for a very, very long time. People um, still pick that one. They still dry it. They still um, still use that one a lot. And um, I think I think it's a really awesome one because it's good for a lot of things. It's good for colds, flus. Um, it's good for coughing, um, sore throats. It's just, it's, it's an all around good medicine. If you're finding it, it's good for allergies. And um, so that one, um, most of our medicines we use, uh, we use them as one tablespoon of the medicine per one cup of boiling water. Most of our medicines are teas, but we also do have um, tinctures. We have, um, we have uh, salves and we have poultices. So we have a lot of different um, ways of using them, but generally speaking, most of them are teas. So, um, and most of the dosages are one tablespoon of the medicine per one cup of boiling water. And um, so where's the number six? So I have some dried stuff here. So we pick the, we offer our tobacco, we pick the plant and we pick the, um, the number six at the bottom the bottom of the stem. So some of the plants, you know, they could be like this long and uh, we pick bunches of them. And so maybe I'll pick about like 10 or 12 of the plants. And then we just turn them upside down. We tie them together with a string and then we just hang them up and let them dry. And there isn't a right or wrong way to dry. It's kind of whatever works for you. So for the tall stem ones, that usually works best for me where I can, um, where I can bind them together and then just hang them up. But you could even just put them in a paper bag and let them dry. You could put them in, uh, some people um, get those laundry nets um, that you put laundry in and they'll, put, they'll dry their medicines in there. So it's kind of whatever works best for you and how much room you have to, um, to dry the medicines. So we just hang those up, let them dry. You let them dry for about a month or two until they're real dry and crispy. And, what I find works really good is even just taking a paper grocery bag. Um, once they're dry, you take that whole bunch, put them in the paper bag, and then you can like break it up and, um, you know, get all of the leaves and the um, things off 
any kind of, you know, the leaves and the flowers. And then you can kind of break up the stalks and the stems and, um, and then we pour them into a jar. And um, that's how we preserve them for the year. And then it's all um, dried and um, it's all um, dried and ready to be preserved. So I'm not sure if you can see that. That's the, the purple flower. And then there's the little dry, the little dry green leaves. And they also smell really good too. They smell, um, they smell like um, kind of peppery. Um, it just smells really good. And in the summer, that's a good way to identify them too. They around here they usually grow like July, uh, mid July into August. And there's about a four week period where they're going to be um, at full bloom. And you want to pick them when that um, purple flower is all purple and it has like little tassels coming from it. And uh, that's that's about the time that you want to pick it. And um, with the number six, you need to pick it within that time period um, before it before the um, the plant kind of goes because it's it's a quick season for that one. Some of our other plants you can you know kind of take the whole summer to go gather, but there are a few where you have to go gather it when it's when it's there. And then um, and then you just got to kind of watch it you know. So when you see the first purple um, flowers coming out, then you kind of wait just a little bit longer, maybe a week, and uh, and then it'll kind of be at full bloom. And then different patches um, get ripe at different times. So, um, but you're going to need to make sure you get out there and get it. Um, so you have it in the winter in January when you need it. So, um, so then we just put it in the jar and um, a lot of people from our tribe have um, given us so much advice on how to do the medicines. So every little detail that people tell us, it just, we just keep on learning more and more and more. So instead of the, the little um, metal ring or the metal thing that goes inside of these jars. We take a piece of fabric and cut a square. And um, two, two people from our tribe had came up to me after a presentation and told me that this is, this is how that they, um, they do this. And so it just was like so neat when they came up to me and told me about that. I just was like, wow, okay. So you just put the um, fabric on and then you put the cover on the top. And um, so you can still um, have air going into your plants and it kind of lets the plants breathe and it also keeps them, um, lets them be dried. And um, it's a good way to preserve the medicines. So we put them in a glass jar. Um, you can preserve them any way that you want to, but we find that they, um, that they stay dry and stay fresh really well um, by doing it this way. So, um, the only reason why we dry the medicines too is so that we, when we're picking them in July, we'll have them in January. You can use them fresh um, and you can use them, you can use them by August or, you know, September, whenever, after you pick them. But, um, but also the only reason why is just so we have them. And we try to pick, we try to pick for the year. We try to pick a year's worth, but sometimes it's really hard to gauge that. So, um, so you just kind of guesstimate. And I really think what it is, is just being mindful and, um, and aware of, um, you know, how much you're picking, uh, in order to get like a quart jar full, you really don't need that much. You might need like two bunches full of number six when you pick it and that'll fill up a quart jar. So it really goes a long way. We also do the one to four rule where, you know, if there's four plants there, we pick one. And then as I go through the, um, the prairie and the, the field, uh, I would just, you know, pick one here, pick one there. You just kind of keep walking and keep picking. And, um, and then after you get through the whole field or whatever you're picking, you look back and it doesn't really look like you picked. So that's kind of a general rule that I follow to um, make sure that we um, don't, you know, that we stay within that where we're not um, over picking, but um, you'd have the way that these grow, they're very abundant. You'd have to pick a lot to over pick. So, and then also you're offering that tobacco. So that's a big, that's a big thing too, where, um, where it's gonna grow back and, um, and sustain itself. So, um, so then when we, when we take this, we um, boil a cup of water. You can just even just, you know, take a mug of water and 
foil that. And then um, I use, I like these steepers, any kind of steepers. You don't have to use a steeper. You could just put your medicine into the water. Um, uh, some, some people like to, or you could just pour it through a strainer, whatever you would want to do. Um, that's all your preference too. But um, it's, it's super simple uh, to do it this way too. And then you just fill up your, your medicine in your little steeper. And um, so you've got your cup of boiling water water. You've got your tablespoon of the number six in your steeper. And it's so simple. You just put the, um, the medicine from your steeper into the water, and then you let it steep about 10 minutes, and that's your medicine. And then you would take about three cups a day of the number six when, you're, when you have like a full-fledged cold or the flu. Um, I like to take it when you first feel that sore throat coming on, or you first start feeling like um, you're your um, lymph nodes are getting a little swollen. That's when I like to start taking it because it'll really help with um, maybe not getting sick or having, you know, not as bad of symptoms as you would normally do. You kind of um, catch it before, before you get it. And, um, and it just makes you feel really good and um, helps you rest and, um, and then you um, helps you get better. So the number six is really good for that, for the colds, the flus, um, and then even just drinking tea makes you feel a lot better. Uh, if you have like a fever and you're really hot, you could drink it cold if you want. You could put it in the fridge and um, drink it cold. Or um, if you're really cold and um, you have the chills, drinking it warm is good. But it's all your preference on, um, or if you just like it, um, you know, like room temperature, you can do it that way too. But it's all your preference on how, um, how you want to drink it, if you want to drink it cold or warm or hot. Uh, that's all, all up to you and how you're feeling and things like that too. And then you just take it until, um, until you're feeling better. So, um, that one is really, really good for, for the colds. Then, um, the next one we, um, we use is mullen and, um, that one is really good. That one, I mean, mullen can grow to be six feet tall or seven feet tall. It can get to be really huge and it can get to be really wide. And then mullen grows, um, like in the most unexpected areas. It does grow in, you know, like prairies and fields and things like that. But I mean, there can be a pile of dirt from a construction site and there can be a big piece of mullein growing on it. So it's pretty amazing um, how strong mullein is and um, how tough it is that it can grow in like really unlikely conditions. So, um, so the mullein, um, we use the leaves of that and we don't use the yellow flowery, we just use the leaves. So with that one, you're always gonna to wanna to put your tobacco down. And um, sometimes the plants are a little smaller too, so you could pick the whole plant and then bind that and hang it up and dry it. Or you could pick the leaves. And um, another way to dry would be um, to put the leaves in a basket. And I like the black ash splinter baskets, the Native American baskets that are made out of wood. Um, but that's all just preference, but I just have a, like a little obsession with uh, black ash baskets. But um, you can put the leaves inside of these and, um, and let them dry that way or um, lay them out or, you know, whatever, whatever is your preference to let, um, to let them dry. And with um, mullen, it's a little bit of a thicker leaf. So sometimes it's a little hard to tell if it's fully dry or not. So I always give that one a good two months to dry. And, um, and then that one, will, it will get dry and crispy and you can break it up. But um, in the summer, it's very, um, it's a very thick leaf, very um, strong. So, um, so that one takes just a little bit longer, longer to dry. And then the same thing with that one, we, um, where's my mullet? There it is. Um, that one, we break that one up um, and, uh, and then we put it in jars as well. So um, at, this, these are um, sample ones, but I usually dry, dry them by the gallon jar full and I probably get about like uh, three to five gallon jars full of each med medicine per summer. Uh, to last us throughout the whole year. For the number six and the colds, the co number six, we probably get a good six or seven gallon jugs full, jars full. Um, the ones that we use more of, um, we really gather a lot of those because a lot of people um, will ask for 
certain ones and there are some that people use more of. And number six is definitely one of those. And we have um, all kinds of people that um, some people, maybe they didn't get a chance to gather. Maybe they, um, maybe they don't gather anymore. They might be, it might be a little bit harder for them to get out and gather. Um, maybe they just didn't have a chance. Maybe they um, ran out, things like that. So, um, so we always try to have the medicines for them when they, when they need them. So the mullein, um, that one is just, um, it, it's nice and dry and crispy when it, um, when it gets all dry. And the same thing with the mullein is um, one tablespoon of the mullein per one cup of boiling water. We do it the same way with the, um, the steeper or however you wanna do it. You can make bigger batches too, if you want, <clears throat> and then just save them for later. <coughs> and, um, and then put them in the fridge and um, drink off them that way too, if you want to. You can, um, and then you could, um, you know, just, uh, you know, if you want to make four cups at a time, you need four tablespoons. You just kind of add it up that way and, and make it that way too. So, um, so that will work too. And then this one too, we just dry it in the jar with the fabric and the, the cover with no lid. And then the next one is the sumac. So that one, um, we use the staghorn sumac, staghorn sumac. <laughs> And um, that one um, is the one that our people use for, um, for the colds and the flus. And uh, we use that one for like the chest, the lungs. Um, you can use it for asthma. Um, like a, it's good for bronchial coughs. It helps you cough up the phlegm. Um, it's kind of an expectorant and um, it's really, really good for the lungs. And um, that one is, uh, you know, really good for that. So we use that one for um, the the staghorn sumac. We just gather the um, the little red berries, the little um, piece of red berries that grow, and um, we gather that one after the first frost. So um, uh, it's kind of a logistical reason because after the first frost, all the bugs are out, uh, they've done their thing, they've made it into the medicine we need, and um, it's just the right time to pick the medicines for us. So it's really simple too, they're kind of, uh, the trees are kind of drying out a little bit, things like that. So it's, sumac is actually very easy to pick, and um, it's very fast too, because the berries, I mean, some of them can get to be, they, I mean, some of them can really get to be this long and like this wide, but you know, most of the time, maybe they might be about this big. So when you're gathering uh, and they snip right off, so you just take, take it at the bottom of the little berry bat, the berry, the piece of berries, and you just take the bottom and you snap it off and um, you can take that whole piece. So that adds up after a while. So, um, so I mean, you could get out there and get what you need in about 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes. So it's pretty, um, it's pretty simple when you um, start going, getting out there and trying it and seeing how much you need and things like that. So that one, um, we, I usually um, put that one in like paper bags to let them dry and then um, let them dry for a good two months too, because the berries are kind of, um, uh, they're kind of furry. So it's kind of hard to tell if they're like for surely all the way dried. And so I always give those a good two months to let them dry as well. And then, um, and then once they're all dried, you can, um, you can just put the whole entire piece of berry um, stem in there, or you could break them up and put them in, in the jars as well. So that one, um, that one looks like this. So this one is kind of, this is the, the bottom part of the medicine right here. That's the bottom part. And then you would just break that right off. And then this one, the berries probably came all the way up to here. And then you would just snap it right off so you can see that. So, and then when you use it, you would just take your steeper and then, um, Fill that one up with, with sumac. This one might be a little big, but I would just fill it up. You can just fill, fill it up like this. And then you have your, your cup of boiling water. And then you just put the, put the sumac in it. 
and let it steep for about 10 minutes as well. And, um, and then that's your tea. And this one, um, all three of those, you would drink um, three cups a day when you're, when you have like a full fledged cold or um, coughing or whatever you're doing. And um, that one um, is really good for, you know, the chest and the lungs and things like that. And then the last one we'll talk about is the blackberry, the blackberry bark, black cherry bark. I'm sorry, thinking of blackberries. <laughs> But um, black cherry bark, this is from the black cherry tree. And um, we pick from, um, from trees that are probably about like this big. Um, they're a full grown tree, um, you know, real tall, tall trees. And then they have a little, at the end of the summer, they have a little, little black, black cherry on them. And, um, and then uh, our people use those to can and, um, and make like jelly and jam and things like that out of them too. And so, um, so like, you know, the black cherry, um, you know, any kind of black cherry flavored things, uh, that's what they use those for. And then, um, so the black cherry bark on the tree, it kind of, um, it grows on the uh, you know, on the tree, the tree trunk. And then these pieces kind of come out a little bit on the edges. So this one's actually pretty easy to gather too. Um, you can just grab, grab the bark from the tree and then just kind of peel them off. And you're gonna remember to put your tobacco down and then you just peel them off and um, they just come off in little, little strips of bark. And it's pretty easy to gather and um, and then these you um, let dry as well um, in a basket or um, you know on a um, on a counter or you know however you would want to let them dry. And with barks too, I let them dry a good two months because they're so thick and um, you know it's sometimes a little hard to tell. But um, these are so dry now that they just kind of like crack, crack off. And they're kind of like that too when you first pick them. And uh, so the black cherry bark we boil that one. So you would take, um, you would take um, probably like about like three of these and, um, and then boil that in about two cups of water. And then um, this one is really good for um, like a bronchial cough or a dry cough. And you can, um, you can make a tea out of it. And um, you would take like three of these in a, two cups of water, and then you'd boil it for a good 15 minutes. And with barks, they're a little thicker. So you're gonna boil them a little bit longer than um, the leaves where you would just steep them for 10 minutes. So the barks, you can let them um, be in a rolling boil for about 15 minutes, and then it'll boil down. So you can drink that as a tea, but then also you can boil it down even more. Just keep on boiling it and let it get really concentrated. And you can add some type of um, sweetener to it if you want um, like um, uh, honey or maple syrup or sugar or whatever you prefer. And then you just boil it down and let it get really thick. And um, to and we would be you'd be making a cough syrup out of the black cherry bark for cough syrup. It's a homemade one. And um, you would um, boil it down to like a thicker consistency than like today's cough medicines that we that we use. You would boil this down to a thicker consistency. And it's kind of, it's still kind of your preference, but it would be thicker. So then it would kind of coat the throat better as you would take it. And then you would just take one tablespoon of the cough medicine as needed. So but it's very good for, um, it's a cough syrup and it's very good for um, like bronchial cough, um, dry cough <clears throat> and coughing. So like, um, you know, like black cherry cough drops, things like that. I think that's where the, that comes from, the Native Americans. So, um, so it's pretty, pretty, pretty interesting the, um, you know, the, where these medicines come from. We have, um, these grow in um, like hardwood forests and um, and uh, where we live we have quite a few of these trees so it's pretty easy to find them and pretty easy to gather and um, and then um, and then you know it's very easy to use them. Um, I think I covered what I wanted to cover for that but um, if um, I'm ready for questions if anybody's got any questions. 
Great. Well, that was great. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I did have one question came up. I've done, I'm not sure if you covered what the mullen is used for. Um, is that also oh. for colds? Yes, for colds and flus. That okay. one's good for um, for like, um, it's good for colds and coughs and like your throat. So mm -hmm. like if you have a sore throat, um, it, it's really good when you take it, you can just feel it in your throat. But it's also good for coughing and colds and, um, and flus and things like that. Okay, great. All right, so we do have a few questions. Um, I had mm -hmm. one that was sent to me. Um, so it's... Um, for the jars, when you're preserving, is there any particular type of cloth that is preferred, like something like natural, like a cotton um, that is recommended for that? Yeah, I think um, a lot of people use the, um, the just the cotton. A lot of times um, uh, with Native Americans, the calico is really popular, the design, but I think it's just your preference too. Okay. So. Um, you know, what would match your kitchen. One time somebody gave me a set of jars and it was all like yellow and white plaid. They were just like perfect. It was really <laughs> cool. So, um, so I think it's preference, you know, to match your kitchen or your design or, or whatever you like. Um, or like if you're giving a gift or something, you could make it the way that the other person likes it. So I don't think there's really, um, you know, like a particular one that you would need. It's your preference. Okay. Great. Um, so the next question, um, is there a particular time that you gather the cherry bark? Uh, the cherry bark we get, uh, you can actually gather barks all year round. Okay. So like if you want to go out in January when it's really cold in a snow pile, you can still go get the bark in January. But if you want to have it all dry and preserved in a jar and ready for you, so when it's cold out, you don't have to go get that. You can just go to your medicine cabinet and grab it. Um, you can gather it in the in the summer or the fall or whenever. So okay. with barks, you can gather anytime you want. Okay. Whatever convenient for you. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, mm -hmm. We have another question. Um, uh, one of our attendees said that his wife processes wool and um, wanted to know if you had any knowledge of any dye plants that were typically used by your tribe. Oh, okay. The sumac definitely. Um, is used, um, the, I know that they used it with, uh, to dye like these baskets, the mm -hmm. black ash baskets, and then they would make a tea out of the medicine and, or out of the sumac, the staghorn sumac berries, and then um, dip, the, dip the strips in there and, um, and then dye them that way. Mm -hmm. And um, that one is really amazing too when you make it. So you're, you've got your boiling water. As soon as you put the medicine into the water, it instantly turns red too. Mm -hmm. So if you do a very, um, a very concentrated um, dye bath of the sumac, um, it's going to get really red. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, next question. So um, are you aware of any medicine plants that would grow here in the Berkshires um, or that, um, that, but that don't grow in Wisconsin? Um, yes, we have, um, all, all of the medicines that, um, are in the book grow out there. Oh, great. So we're very lucky that we've had actually two people that read the whole book and, um, and actually let me know that all the medicines that are in the book grow out there. So, I mean, it was just like, so amazing that they cared enough to like come and wow. find me and tell me about that. Um, we do have one, it's called Moosewood. Um, it's Acer Pennsylvanicum, and that one used to grow very abundantly around here, but now it's getting a little bit warmer. So, um, and not like as cold as night in the cold during the night. Um, so that one, um, it still grows a little bit in like Door County, Wisconsin, which is kind of on the, the finger part of Wisconsin. But, um, that one, we were just out there, um, this summer and, um, we were climbing Monument Mountain. And it's just full of moosewood. So I had seen moosewood um, at a um, at a nature preserve. They have some in um, in Madison, but they're like real big giant trees. They must have been there for a long time. So I haven't seen the little, you know, like the little sapling trees. So we're walking up the mountain, and I just thought, wow. Um, I think that's moosewood. So we took a quick picture and um, and then later, you know, I, I asked another friend out there. He's like, yep, that's the moosewood. And um, so it was very cool. So that one actually grows very abundant out there. 
but we don't um, really have a lot of it in our area. But we used to actually have it grow right on our reservation, but now I don't think it um, grows as much anymore just because of the temperature changes. Oh, okay. Yeah, I see that. Um, so but that's another... the only one that I know of. Okay. Yeah, no, that's that's so interesting. I'll have to look up that one. I'll have to look for it next time I go to Monument Mountain. <laughs> yeah, and it's just like right when you're, you know, like right when you get on the trail, probably like um, 50 steps in and it's just like full of the moose wood. Wow. Um, all right, mm -hmm. next question that's come up. Um, somebody wanted to know, would you mix all four of these in a tea for something extra strong and medicinal? Um, yeah, for me, um, mo uh, most of the time I don't I don't really mix um, because usually if you're using like a, like usually if I get a cold I'll start out with number six and then um, and then as I'm getting better but like you know like you're getting better but you still have like that dry cough then maybe I'll switch to Mullen for the cough. Um, so for me, my preference is. Um, you know, not to really mix. And then a lot of the ways that I've learned from other people, um, you know, people just pretty much stick to, you know, stick to that. Like they'll stick to the number six, then they'll go to the Mullen mm -hmm. or they'll do this, the Fumac or, you know, things mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so next question, we have a few more. Um, so what, what some, someone wants to know what you use for aches and pains related to winter colds or arthritis, if you have any recommendations. The number six is also good for aches and pains. Okay. So, um, so like you can just, um, you know, take that one, you know, like it, it's like for all the symptoms of a cold. So, mm -hmm. you know, you're coughing, you have a sore throat, you're tired, you have aches, you have pains. <laughs> yeah. It's good for everything. <laughs> so the number six is good for that. Great. And then did okay. you say arthritis? Yes, that's what was the next. And one, just curious about um, arthritis. Yeah. Okay, we use yarrow, and that one grows, out, it's a prairie plant, mm -hmm. grows out in the prairies in the fields. Mm -hmm. And um, that one, I usually gather that one with number six, it grows around the same time, but that one has a longer growing season. So you can get that from like the beginning of the summer to like the end of summer. Okay. But that one, pick the same way as number six. You put your tobacco down, you grab the bottom of the stalk. It grows about um, probably like four or five feet tall. Mm -hmm. And then grab that one at the bottom of the stem. And then that's the one too, where we gather it in bunches, um, draw, tie it with um, string and then just hang it up and let it dry. Mm -hmm. And that when you wanna let it dry, go one to two months and then you can just break it up and put it in jars as well. Mm -hmm. And then that one we use, um, that one's a very strong one. So you just pretty much need, um, you know, like, uh, if you do one stalk, you would do like a saucepan full of water and then you would boil it and boil it and boil it until it's a tincture mm -hmm. and you boil it way down. And then you would, um, the way that they taught us, taught us to do this is those little orange juice glasses from, they're kind of like old fashioned. They're about this big and about this big around their little tiny juice glass, you fill that with water and then you just take one tablespoon of the tincture of yarrow and you put it in the, the cup of water. And then you would just take that once a day for arthritis and it's good for like inflammation. It's good for like mild forms of arthritis mm -hmm. and um, inflammation like that. And then um, you could just do like a one cup of that a day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, oh, that's great. Um, so the next and then all of these are in the book too. So Yarrow oh, good. is touched upon in the book too. Great. And I did share at the beginning, I shared the link if people wanted to go buy the book as well. So hopefully you will, okay. hopefully a number of people will. Okay. <laughs> um, so we have a couple more questions. Yeah. Um, so somebody asked, uh, for the medicines in the book, are the, um, are the plants usually harvested from the wild or do you also grow them in your gardens? Um, gather them from the wild. So um, we, we are very lucky, you know, with our tribe that um, we have a lot of land to gather from. And we, when we gather them too, I didn't mention this, we always want to gather in places that are like less, less touched, more untouched. Mm -hmm. so, um, so we have a lot of land that we can do that at. And then, um, then we gather the wild ones. 
So um, I personally am not a very good growing person. I can't really grow things very well. So I'm more of a gatherer. <laughs> That's great. I mean, yeah. you know, everybody's different when it comes to gardening. So. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Okay. So let's see. We have another question. Um, do you have any recommendations for plants that are good for poultices? Um, the, the, probably the most popular one that our people use is the plantain, the planter's leaf. Mm -hmm. Um, that one is just so amazing because it just, I mean, you can take two steps out of your door or in many places and there'll be planter's leaf growing there. Mm -hmm. And, um, that one, we make sure we put our tobacco down and then we just, um, pick it, pick the leaves, and then you can just put the leaves in your palm and then, um, pulverize them in your hand until they get all like the juices come out of the plant and um, you can put it directly onto a sore or um, it's even good for like eczema and psoriasis some people will even just pick the leaves put it right onto the eczema and psoriasis and then wrap it and then sleep with that on there Mm -hmm. But it's really good for like um, sores. It's good for like bee bites, um, healing up um, infections, wounds, things like that. Great. Okay. Oh, no, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, we do have a comment saying that um, for all four of these plants grow abundantly um, in somebody's yard in Pittsfield. So <laughs> I think they're happy. Nice. That <laughs> um, and we do have another comment from someone calling mullen a crazy plant <laughs> that it's practically <laughs> indestructible so <laughs> and sometimes you're just like amazed at how huge they grow i mean <laughs> one plant could you know um provide almost for like a whole community you know sometimes they're that big <laughs> it, it becomes a big weed but it's also very useful so it's fine yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, a lot of people look at we look at them as weeds, but um, <laughs> they have lots of uses. <laughs> right, right. Lots of medicinal properties. I mean, this is great, and I, I will definitely look at. I'm going to look up all of these plants, I think, in detail, and take a look at your book. But it will certainly make me look at some of the you know so-called weeds a little bit more closely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, oh, one more question um, before we get going. Um, so, someone wanted to know if you had any recommendations for what you would use for poison ivy. Um, we can, you can also use, um, the planter's leaf for that, but, um, we have a really good one, sweet fern, and that one's in the book and that one grows kind of, uh, by, um, like sandy soil by lakes. And, um, when you walk up to it, it smells really sweet. Mm -hmm. So I think that's how it got the name sweet fern. And it's kind of a sagey, um, sagey, little small sagey tree, a bushy tree. And it has like leaves, leaves on it. So we just go and we gather the leaves. We pull, we gather them probably about like in August when they're fully grown. Mm -hmm. And then we just um, pull the leaves off when we gather it. You put your tobacco down, gather the leaves, and then that you can um, just dry in like a basket or a bag. And um, you just let them dry for you know like one one month until they're nice and crispy. And then that one. Um, you just boil, you like take a handful and boil it in a, probably about like five cups of water and um, per handful. And um, you let that boil just for about like five minutes. And then um, we use that liquid to either dab on the poison ivy or my friend actually came up with this really good idea. She puts it in a spritzer bottle and then um, we can, we just keep it in the fridge and you can just spritz it on as you need it. So like if your kid has a, it's good for many kinds of skin issues. So it's good for, um, you know, like poison ivy, it's good for poison oak, um, rashes, uh, bug bite. So like if your kid needs it real quick, you just grab it on the fridge, spritz it on, and then it helps with that. It helps with like if you hit nettles when you're walking in the woods, um, you can just spray it on, but it's really good for poison ivy, yeah. so. Um, we've that's had a great idea to spritz it on. That's perfect. I know. You don't want to touch I totally, it. <laughs> I totally stole her idea. And then she made um, uh, moist towelettes out of it too. So she dipped um, paper towels in in um, sweet fern. And then she folded them up and put them in a baggie. So then she could take them with her because she actually broke out into a stress rash um, one summer and, um, but she was like really busy that week. I think she had like a wedding and she had like all these things going on in one week and she broke out into a stress rash. So she was spritzing and she was dabbing on with her moist towelettes. And I was like, I am totally stealing your ideas because 
That is really cool, especially with the poison ivy, then you're not like double dipping. You wouldn't want to um, double dip your, um, like if you put a washcloth into it and then you dab it on, you don't want to put it back into your medicine. Right. So it's especially good for something that's like, you know, going to spread. Right, right. No, that's, mm -hmm. that's a great idea. Um, and then we have one yeah. last comment. Somebody's noted that the plantain tincture is really good for tick bites as well. So I guess they've tried it out and said <laughs> the plantain works great for tick bites. Oh, nice. The oh, the sweet fern? Yes. Oh, well, or she the... said the, the plantain tincture, which I think that's the one oh. we were talking about earlier. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So I, I just couldn't hear all of a sudden. So I was yeah, like, that's okay, okay. The plantain. Cool. That's awesome. <laughs> great. Well, I think we've gotten through all of the questions. Um, so I just want to say thank you. This was so fascinating. I can't wait to take a look at your book now and take it out with me when I walk in the woods near my house to see <laughs> which plants I have growing. <laughs> but uh, we really yeah, appreciate find you taking the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no problem. Thank you. Great, great. Have a great rest of the winter. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> you too. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you. Bye. Bye.